very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Cafredo TV on the Unpack Show. Today, we are very privileged and honored to host yet an insightful person, a leader, a mentor, uh, an entrepreneur, and uh, he's been create, uh, you know, credited for 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 revolutionizing, you know, uh, business education. And today, we are very privileged to have him and learn from him. Uh, Professor Waso Balunyo, more than welcome. Thank you very much. Great. Okay, uh, we just want to have a small interaction with you to understand your journey and uh, how you've been able to do what you do, where you see education going, and you know, understand how you can be able to contribute uh, to, to what we're equally doing as well as this uh, mentorship for young people. But uh, to start with, you know, just to inform our viewers, we'll say, uh, you could tell us more of who Professor Waswa Balonio is. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Balunya, presently I'm the principal of Makere University Business School. Uh, in a sense, call it a founder uh, of this institution. Uh, I've come a long way. I was born in Iganga. My father was a teacher. Oh, okay. And uh, he moved from teaching to administration. Okay. And he's reported to have had very good management skills mm. from the people I've had. Okay. Uh, I was privileged All because right. uh, I cannot say I came from a poor family. Okay. Actually, whenever I'm showing off, I say, <laughs> you know. I, I've got my friends whom we, we you know, joke with. Yeah. Uh, I tell them I grew up in the Mercedes Benz, you know, I, uh, the, the water based toilets is something which is not new to me. Yeah. Uh, so, really, I was privileged. Okay. I went to Muiri Primary School, one of the best schools, I think, in the country then. And uh, uh, I think my aspirations started there. Okay. We had a farm next door to us where there were whites and there were horses. All right. So, I always aspired to ride a horse. Okay. And when you come to my house, you're going to find paintings or horses. Okay. And um, uh, I loved the horses because of the power they had. So then I wanted to live by the lake side. You know, uh, I don't know why, but that's what, that was my dream. Uh, I must tell you, I can't swim, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Much as I want to live, I live by the water, I don't, want to, I don't, I don't swim. Mm -hmm. I'm the only person in my house who can't swim. And guess what happened? I was forced to swim by Father Grimes. And uh, I don't like to be forced to do things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that is the only reason why I can't swim. Because you used to force us, go and swim. Why do you force me to do something you don't want to do? Okay. So I went to Ginger College where I was dismissed, suspended so many times, dismissed. I went to Namasagali College. And uh, Father Grimes used to dismiss me, but he would come and collect me. Now, what was that? that I, I was stubborn, I think. I was stubborn. I, I, I didn't like rules. I didn't like to, to, to do things which are routine. Uh, that was me. All right. Uh, I wanted to do law in Makere at that time. The good courses were law, commerce. I, I didn't get law, so I got... I think a degree in political science, and uh, uh, an uncle of mine who has been looking after us took me to India. When I got to India, India was a second degree, so I decided to do commerce. And uh, Indians are extremely bright people. You know, there are some who don't want to study, they are going around the institution all the time. But uh, being a foreigner in a country like India, India is a big experience. If you live in India, you'll be able to live anywhere else in the world. Right. And you want to see people who, who are doing business, go to India, you'll see them doing business. In anything, it's, it's a very, very diversified country, lots of contradictions. In India, you'll find the poorest people on the street in India, people who have had their family on the street. You know, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, to, to produce babies on the street, you must do certain things on the street. So they, 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 they are born there. And then there are some people who are very wealthy, extremely stinking rich people. 
that extreme in India is there. Uh, so I learned a lot about what takes place in India and uh, maybe it, it, it reinforced what I wanted to do. So I wanted to be a teacher. I came back into, to Uganda and uh, went to Makerere. And I was so disappointed when I got to Makerere. You go there at 8 in the morning by 11. There's nobody in the university. And uh, so <coughs> I wanted to do something. I wanted to be occupied. Uh, I remembered that in India, I used to stay in a, a private flat. But near the flat where I was staying, there was a hub of kids going to evening classes. So for five years, I proposed to Makere to start evening classes, and they were like, no. You mean people are going to pay? They're going to buy degrees, literally buy degrees? I said, no. Somebody, right now, government is paying for the people. Mm -hmm. But we want to increase access. People will pay. Not that they're going to pay and take away a degree without studying. Mm -hmm. After five years of, you know, uh, uh, up and down negotiating, they allowed us to start. And uh, that startup, now look at it from the entrepreneurship point of view, right. was a risk. I took 300,000 shillings then, 1991. I used it to start the BBA and MBA program. And... Uh, uh, our expectation was if we, if we got 80 people, 89 people would break even. Mm -hmm. We got 200 applications and we finally got 129 people who turned up on the, on the PBA. On our MBA, we finally turned up with about 26 people. Mm -hmm. Now, when I joined Makere, when I, jo when I became dean, took over, I had 200 students. Uh, fast forward, today MOOBS has got 17,000 students. Wow. And uh, we had one degree, a Bachelor of Commerce. Today we have about 20 degrees in uh, various business areas. And if it were not for preventing us from starting new programs, I'm sure we would have more. Possibly, I must say this with confidence, we would be the biggest institution in this country. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, innovation... Change, change, change management. There are always people trying to prevent change from taking place. Okay. So for the last, I think, seven years, we have had no new program. And uh, if you are an institution and you are, you are not growing, you don't have a new program, it means there's a problem with you. Mm -hmm. So right now, MOOBS is stuck. It cannot grow. It cannot innovate because we can't start new programs. Uh, in, in, in business, you either start a new product or you improve the existing product to give the customers either a, a new service or improve what this, this service is doing. Correct. Look at the mobile phone. You know what, what it can do today. But uh, 10 years back, you just use it to call. Yep. You know, now, whoever is producing mobile phones is doing so much. You know, it has got a flash, flashlight. Mm -hmm. Even that, you can imagine, you know, yeah, you, the campus is on the phone. Uh, and some time back, buying a campus was a privilege. But now it's available there. It's a, a so, for everybody. so any institution that does not change with time definitely is destined to what we call the corporate graveyard. Actually, just right there, oh. Professor, uh, that brings me to a question that I really wanted to ask you. Having mentioned that, you know, uh, the, the educational system you've been through and you try to resist many times, definitely you must have realized it was very theoretical and there were no practical or hands-on skills. Uh, I would like to now ask you, where do you actually see, uh, you know, ed ed education in, in the next, you know, ed educational system in the next 20 years from now? Well, what is happening in the developed countries is that they've moved ahead. Okay. Uh, I believe maybe over 50% of the people in the developed countries are using online methods. Here we can't use them because we don't have computers, we don't have internet, it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. So we adjust with a time lag. Uh, Uganda has done very miserably on skills. Okay. 
uh, if you go to Kenya, you go to Nigeria, you go to South Africa, the technical and vocational institutions are very sound. They are very robust. If you are going to make any change in any country, you need those institutions. You need what we now call the terminology is technical universities. Mm -hmm. Vocational institutions produce a technician. Mm -hmm. When you turn it into a university, you produce a technologist. The technologist is somebody who works with the engineer to bring products into reality. Mm -hmm. Uganda has that gap. And as you struggle with your innovation here in this country, unless you fulfill that gap, you're not going to see any innovation in this country. They're going to come down from China. So Uganda needs to put its act together on technical and vocational education. Okay. We must do something in it. We must revolutionize it. If we don't, then we shall continue to see all these imports from China, including the toothpick. Because, you know, quite challenging, yeah? We can't do it. So we need that change. We need to promote more of those technologists, those institutions which are going to, to, to work with engineers. You know, engineers are not inventors, Mr. Mm -hmm. But they have the knowledge, they do research, they're able to say something. Now, the technologist is who looks at what the engineer is doing and converts it into a product. Now, China, German, Japan, they've got all these things. The US is very good in other innovations, you know, uh, but not this product like, product type. They are more in the concepts, you know, into services. And of course, the US continues to have the largest number of innovations, and that's why it continues to, to be dominating. dominating the world. So in terms of the future of education, if we do not change that, yeah. we are going to be a consuming society. We shall never produce anything. We cannot industrialize because things are coming from China so cheap. So, yes, uh, we need to do a lot about improving education in this country. We need to we need to get more free education at the lower levels. We need to get more people in, in, into school. Lead to, to me, there is no reason why this country does has people, young boys and girls, out on the street, not in school. Because they are the ones with the ideas. Yeah. You know, when I see these young faces here, I, I feel I wish I was like them, you know. Because that's where the future is. That's where the ideas are. Okay. And in terms of product, what they want in the future is what should be produced. So our education system, if we do not change it, we are going to have a big problem. We shall stay a consumer, a society. People were simply picking up products from other people. Yeah. And um, uh, because you need to understand the technology convert it into a product or service. And in most of the incubation centers that we have, we, are, we have more IT innovations because the actual products are difficult to make. Yeah. They are available in China, why do you try? Everything you want will be will up in China because they have those skills. Yeah. So the future of education, I don't know, it, it depends on uh, the politicians who are going to drive us that way. Yeah. Uh, but they need to listen to you. you know, they need to listen to people who are talking about where technology is going. Correct. Yeah. Well tackled and well said because uh, uh, I, I was going to make a mention that I wish you were the one leading in, in, in some of the key areas we're talking about so that we have a revolution in those areas. But nevertheless, time is coming to make sure that we make sure we drive, uh, you know, lead such revolutions. Uh, now, you made a mention of how China is leading in such areas. You made a mention of how we actually need these kind of skills to make sure that our young people are able to become you know, very much enterprising. I'd like to know what your thought is on social enterprise. Ah, very controversial. Uh, Muhammad Yunus, Professor Muhammad Yunus, the founder of the Grameen Bank, has been the key person who uh, is advocating for social enterprise. If you go to my Facebook, you will see me sharing a picture with him there. Uh, he is saying that uh, capitalism has failed. Uh, I hope my audience understands what I'm talking about. 
the the Western countries which are running businesses the way they are running them has failed in the sense that it is creating more poor people. The rich are becoming richer and the poor are becoming poorer. You go to school, you study, then you go to this eight to five job and all you do is earn that small money. But there are people out there who are earning large sums of money, yeah. but you do the work. Yeah. So Muhammad Yunus has been proposing the social enterprise, saying that the way to go is to encourage social enterprise. Uh, it has its benefits and the dark side. The benefits is that the social enterprises are innovators who do not necessarily seek profit. Yeah. They use that profit to support communities. They use that profit to see that there's improvement in society. Whereas the typical capitalist, I mean, makes the money and you know goes away. For himself. It's, it's for himself. Yeah. Maybe buy himself a second jet. Yeah. You know, because the other jet doesn't look very nice inside. Yeah. You know, the, the, <laughs> these are the decisions that they take. You know, um, uh, I, I, I must, I must say, I'm also very well paid, so maybe part of that. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, I, I go and say, ah, these shoes don't look nice, then I go and buy another pair. Yeah. But some people have to struggle to buy a pair. Yeah, and they don't have it actually. And they don't have the cash to buy the mm -hmm. pair. So you go to buy the old shoes, you know. Yeah. Uh, now, so social enterprise should be able to support the larger number of people yeah. to be able to get off the ground. But the dark side of social enterprise is that this world has grown as a result of pursuit for profit. Correct. This world is growing because people are selfish. They want to earn money. They want to do something and earn and live well. Social enterprise is saying you don't have to do that. You earn, but give the money to those others who are not so well off. Now, the consequence of this is to... Uh, kind of put a stop to innovations and new ideas. Why do I have to work so hard when I'm going to give away the money? Mm -hmm. You know, and how many people are like that in this in this world? So these are the challenges of social enterprise. They are very good in our in our countries where uh, we're really helping many young people, especially to start up. Yeah. Start up, go and do your things. Because I you don't charge them commercially. Correct. You know, they, they, they need to pay some little money here and there, but they, they, if they went out to seek consultancy, they would, so they would have to pay, pay so much. More, yeah. yeah. So th that's the issue of social enterprise. Uh, MOOBs uh, trained uh, social entrepreneurs in, uh, in, uh, in uh, English-speaking Africa. We've had a network. I don't know how it is doing now. I haven't had a feedback from them. Uh, they're doing a great job. Great job, but their challenge is sustainability, especially in terms of financial resources. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Professor would like to take this, you know, to to further understand because uh, when you made a mention that uh, enterprise majorly focuses on making sure that you make the money to help other people to be able to start up and be able to evolve, I'm pretty much aware that. You could be informed also knowing what we're having or what we're experiencing today. For someone to start a business in the community, maybe from your experience or from your insight, uh, how can someone build a community-based company, in your opinion, very successfully? It's not easy. I have, uh, uh, we have a foundation in uh, our father's name, and uh, we've, we've trained over 2,000 young people and encouraging to start up. Uh, I work with another foundation in Iganga Town, Plus 256 Youth Platform, and they help young people to start up, or to, to really realize their potential. You know, not necessarily start up, but realize their potential. For instance, they, they encourage kickboxing, they encourage uh, actual boxing, they encourage uh, a variety of things, yeah. so that these people can get their talents you know, uh, exploit them, develop them so that they can benefit from it. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said earlier on, the challenge is sustainability of resources. So these social enterprises will have a problem when they can't find the money. 
That's why Muhammad Yunus is saying, let these social enterprises go out to actually run a business. But don't pocket the profit. Use that profit to do other things. Yeah. Because that entrepreneur, the social entrepreneur, is first of all an entrepreneur. And entrepreneurship is about innovations, about change, about you know um, feeling uncomfortable with what you have. That's entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why you have startup, continuous startup. You have uh, buys, you know, buying businesses and this kind of thing. Now, the whole point is having the social aim at the end of it all. That yes, I feel for the society that I need to make some improvements in society. Yeah. So my, my feeling is that. It's not easy to say, make profit, don't take it, give it to other people. It's not an easy thing. It takes a lot of uh, uh, commitment, motivation uh, to be able to build one. Yeah. But you need to network, definitely. Correct. You need to network, you, you, you need to come up, come together with other people and, they, uh, and sell them your vision. Mm -hmm. Because having like-minded people is not easy. You know, you, 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 in any management team, in any organization, there are people who like what is going on and those who don't like what is going on. Correct. Now, you must be able to sell that vision to the people you're working with to be able to say, yes, we want to do this. We, mm -hmm. want, to do, we want to be a social enterprise. Yeah. So you need a team, you need people you can work with to actualize what you're doing. Yeah. And, uh, uh, of course, the world is, is full of... Uh, money from various sources, can you tap into those resources? You know, look at MasterCard, they've got, they've got money. Rockefeller Foundation has got money. Ford Foundation, uh, Kaufman Foundation. All these have got resources which go towards that. Mm -hmm. uh, look at Bill Gates. He's spending his $50 billion, which he has, on issues of health, to improve health in the world. Yeah. So if your enterprise is in that area, you may be able to tap into the resources that he has. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a controversy that after Bill gets pursuing money for so long and accumulating so much of it, he's now simply giving it away. He just wants to support other people. Yeah, other people, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Having uh, said that very well uh, and understood the fact that someone being in your position is just not a journey, someone walks there they probably must have made some decisions, some choices, some commitments. Uh, probably would like to now ask you, what mindset helped you, uh, you know, to grow where you are exactly or to successfully reach where you are? Because one of the challenges you have today is mindset problem, which is a problem affecting young people today. Yeah, I think personally one of my uh, attributes, if I use that, is I don't like seeing the same thing again and again. I would like to see something different. Uh, I mean, we work with lots of papers and brochures and this. And when you bring me something you did last year and here it is, I, I don't feel comfortable. Um, I, I, I like to continuously improve what I'm doing, to continuously change what I'm doing. And I think that's me. I'm, I'm not comfortable with seeing the same thing again and again and again. I, I like to see something different. Okay. And uh, uh, this is what we technically call innovation. Something new, something different. Uh, so if I have that something new or something different, then I'm moving towards innovation. I'm moving towards creating new products and new, new processes. Uh, for instance, I keep on challenging my colleagues in the departments. Every two, three years, think about a new program. Mm -hmm. Every year, change that course outline marginally because something has happened in the field. Correct. Can you change it? Um, can you incorporate IT? Because literally everything today has got IT. But, you know... Uh, Change agents, innovators, uh, not very many. Mm -hmm. Some people will say this, this man is giving us a difficult time. <laughs> he, she doesn't know how difficult it is to do this. 
but you must if you want to stay ahead you must keep on changing so to me i'm uncomfortable with the same things that i'm seeing all the time i i don't want to see them uh i would like to see improvements in whatever we're doing and uh, in my life i've been uh, in construction okay i i i do my wealth management differently all right through uh, acquisition of land and and construction and uh, when you give me a plan by the time you come back to be different because i keep on improving it depending on where i am in that moment in time yeah you know um and what does that mean i want something that serves my purpose not the purpose of the architect who drew up the plan so i think to me that's my mind is unsettled if i see the same things again and again i mean i, I don't eat pizza you know why no no from where you start to where you end the same thing <laughs> i would just stop eating pizza then <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. all right uh when i was reading much about what you've been able to do over time i i quickly landed on fact that you founded a fo- uh, you you started a foundation uh and uh it's it's something that you know we'll be very glad to learn more about and maybe the li- listeners out there will want to know more so that we understand what kind of work do you do under it and how they can be a part of it or how do this you know create a synergy with what they're doing with what you're doing maybe if i if i talk about that i need to talk about our entrepreneurship center okay because the motivation comes from there uh first of all having done business in india and uh, having seen how india helps small businesses they have a whole ministry and you know lots of assistance to small business so we established the small business development center in 1998 the intention was to grow small businesses and support them it was later on that we turned it into an entrepreneurship center but when we started the name made sense for the people it's a small business development center yeah um what were you trying to do we're trying to help small business succeed but also help people including our students to start up businesses so This center has uh, evolved over time I think now it's known as the entrepreneurship innovation and incubation center yeah, uh attracted some money from Africa Development Bank they're giving okay. them a building and uh, we now have to go into actual innovation in actual incubation yeah we have been using what you call virtual incubation you you talk to us we say we tell you remain where you are which is the future by the way yeah uh we went to germany about 5 years back and we wanted to go and visit incubators most of the incubators we called were virtual say no no we, we don't want, we don't have an office everything of ours is posted online we support people online you know yeah uh here in the developed countries uganda we cannot afford that because i don't know how many of us here have got computers in our homes yes we may have phones uh how many of us have got smartphones maybe all of us have got smartphones but how many of us can afford the bundles as it is yeah. called you know uh you, you've got to fidget with the money that you have to be able to to to, to access internet on that day mm-hmm. you may not be able to use it for a, a course on startup so we did that for the community it's not been easy but uh, mobs is the founder of entrepreneurship studies in the country correct started 1991 92 uh we did a center in 1998 we've been trying out research we are turning out phd's we are disappointed by the way oh. that uh, despite all this knowledge that we've accumulated government goes to do things without okay. consultation they don't have to consult us but if when you are formulating policy academicians have a role to play because the people on ground yeah. yeah they have a role to play and we we know entrepreneurship i mean you wake me up at 3 a.m. in the night and ask me anything in entrepreneurship i'll tell you what it is you know because 
I, I believe I'm that good. I've I've read the whole thing about entrepreneurship. So, but if you take a decision on to teach entrepreneurship in secondary schools and don't come to us, it's a problem. And that's what creates the gap. Yes. Now it's a whole subject in A level. They've removed economics. It's a shame, I must tell you. And this country, in terms of the business studies, is going to have a major problem when you remove economics and you put entrepreneurship studies. Entrepreneurship is, in economics is the mother of all those other subjects, including entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. But now you find a student comes into the university, does not have economics in the business school. Well, very big problem. I think government needs to rethink this. You know, uh, so why am I saying this? We would have been part of the decision-making process and definitely would have said, do not remove economics. Because now the young people are coming into the in this university and they have to start reading economics afresh. Whereas earlier on, they had an advantage. So, uh, we did entrepreneurship. We've done a great job in it, I believe. Yeah. Uh, it's not easy. Incubation is not an easy task. Uh, if at the end of the year, if you had uh, 100 people, if you have two, it's good. But what should, what should you look for? I've told my colleagues, we should not incubate every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Let's look for high-impact, high-value ideas. Yeah. You know? Uh, Ugandans are very good at startups, but where we need support is high-impact. High value. Does 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 the product have impact in society? You know, um, that's what you need to look for. So, our foundation, which was started by people who were helping, we were helping people as a social social enterprise informally. Now, these people who were benefiting actually established the foundation. The young people, and you know, since then we've kind of supported it as a family. Um, why? Because we wanted to do, I cannot take the MOOBS Entrepreneurship Center into my compound. So the foundation helps to do those things that others are done in the, in the, in the, in the center mm -hmm. uh, without uh, the issue of conflict of interest. You know. So I need to give back to society. I need to go back and train young people, give, share the knowledge that I have, Correct. help them to succeed. Correct. But I cannot do it as moves. I need to do it as an individual. And the vehicle to deliver that is the foundation. Yes. Quite interesting, and I'm sure everyone out there that is listening very well, it's very important to seek guidance from the persons that are actually doing this on the ground. And I, I believe that will help us to bridge the gap that is existing in education system or that is helping uh, to see that you know we have mindsets that are very productive, very enterprising, very innovative. And I must say that is great work that you're doing. And then shortly from now, we'll be able to move into an, uh, a Q&A session from the audience, open you know the ground for this uh, audience to be able to ask as many questions as they would like to ask so that they can be able to insightfully also understand what uh, what, what, what you do and probably how they see innovation and entrepreneurship play a role uh, in, in the growth of this, this, this country. So ladies and gentlemen in the audience, at this very moment, we'd like to be able to you know, take the discussion over to you to know are there, uh, you know, are there any key areas of interest that you like Professor Waswa Balunyo to be able to respond to such that we can be able to learn from him and be able to have the privilege to grow our mindsets and our ways of, of doing things. Thank you. By the names I'm called Kagoda Rogers. Uh, my question goes uh, to the something you talked about. You said uh, the innovators, the innovators around are not able to create tangible products. So looking into that aspect, I was I was looking at our country, looking at a country like a landlocked country, uh, importing where we're not able to create most of the raw materials on ground, uh, we're only able to import most of the raw materials from other countries. 
whereby the tax is always going up on the raw materials that are coming in. For example, uh, I was looking at a certain business, uh, which is Musana Cuts. They were designing cuts that were used for street vendors to sell chapati and everything. But they reached a point when they cannot be able to design the cut from here using our raw materials because it was expensive. Using the own materials, the cut was costing about four million. But being able to import raw materials from abroad, the cut had to go as low as 1.5. So in such a situation, when someone wants to create a tangible product, innovate a tangible product, how would you advise them uh, basing on how prices are going up or how taxes are on raw materials that are coming in in the country? Well, you, you raise uh, several issues, but I'd like to say this to all of you here. Excuses are not good reasons. You can have as many excuses as you can, but they'll never give you a good explanation to something. That's complacency. Don't give excuses. State things the way they are. Now, we are importing raw materials, yes. It's a shame that we import some, some of the raw materials. But there's nothing wrong with importing if you are good enough. Japan has no oil, has no iron, iron ore, has no rubber. It imports all these things. But because of the technological advancement, they produce the cheapest car in the world. And because the car is so good, they now overcharge us. Because you know, a Japanese car, Toyota, it will never stop. You try it out. It will, that car, you can knock it, you can do anything you want to do it. They, they, have, ad, they have achieved that highest level of technological advancement in car manufacturing. And uh, with due respect, this Kiva we are doing here, I mean, to me, we are simply putting the money into the wrong place. Uh, I would have put that money into finding out how to produce a bicycle or how to produce an improved hull rather than uh, a car because you can't, you, can't, you can't compete with Japanese. So you can still import a raw material and produce a good product. Now, taxes, I wanted to mention issue taxes. Taxes is an excuse. Every businessman will tell you taxes, taxes. Taxes is an excuse. A tax, by the way, by definition, is a compulsory levy for which you don't expect anything in return. Very weird definition. <laughs> We should pay tax. We should pay taxes as as people because our our governments have to work. Of course, at times we're not happy with the government where the money is going when it is embezzled. But uh, for a country to work, for us to say government it yambe and we're not paying taxes is a contradiction. So for you as young people, I must tell you, paying taxes is an obligation that you must have. It is something that is good for you. It's good for the country because. The government has that collective wisdom that it can give you to be able to, to get the country moving in terms of infrastructure and policy. Why can't Musana produce a product from local materials? Uh, I would say, first of all, that remember what I said? We have technicians, we have no technologists. You know, we have. We have no technologists. We do not have the people. We have lots of resources in this country. Lots of resources. But we do not have people to think about those products and have the technologists who convert them into actual products. So I'm not sure whether Musana has a, a design that is unique to him. I don't think so. Maybe he's looking at design, producing it there. Um, I yet have to look at these people producing bicycles out of bamboo. Uh, how are they doing it? So I think if we go to copy a product, uh, we may get into that problem. That is maybe easier to, to 
to, to, to simply import. But if we, have, if we can produce the technologists in this country, those people who can convert this into products, most likely, I, I can't say, but we may have better solutions, cheaper solutions you know, than what we have at the moment. How would you advise the technologies to go on? Assuming there is one there already, what would be your say? This world is not, does not have very, very many innovations, by the way. There are very few. Uh, today we are riding on mobile technology. Not mobile phone, mobile technology. It's what is driving the world today. Who invented it? Somewhere in the 60s, 70s, by the American military. It has become so popular, it's now doing so many things for, for people. But do we have the technologists here? Uh, I don't know. I don't know because we don't even have a curriculum for them in this country. There's no curriculum for technologists. But if they are there, then they need to be able to follow up in what engineers are doing. Do they have that mind of questioning, that mind of feeling uncomfortable with where they are? They are the people who are going to turn that technology into products and services, especially products which are visible. Otherwise, why should I produce a product when China is producing it cheaply? You know, those are the questions you need to ask yourself. So I would say to that person, look at these technologies that we have, see what is taking place, and see how you can use them to turn them into products. You know, uh, but if you know one, please uh, let, let me know who it is. Maybe you can support this person in different ways. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, uh, for that. some of those insights. I wanted to ask just two brief questions. One is specifically, is specifically reference to Uganda. Uh, part of the research that you're involved in says that Uganda is a very entrepreneur, entrepreneurial country, meaning that uh, maybe we innovate a lot. So my question is, do we still need to put a lot of emphasis on innovation, or we should do focus on those other things that will help them to survive because many of them fail within a year, like intubation. And then two is about social entrepreneurship. You indicated that the uh, downside of social entrepreneurship is that it may demotivate people who want to make profit. But also, but what we see in the reality is that those people who have made a lot of money also, they're among the biggest uh, uh, people who are involved in social entrepreneurship. You rightfully talked about, when you talked about Bill Gates, you said it's an irony. Maybe you would elaborate more. Thank you. Uh, Uganda is ranked as one of the most entrepreneurial countries. What does that mean? The number of startups, that's what one of the things that measure entrepreneurship in Uganda is one of the highest. Three out of ten people will start a business. In uh, the U.S., uh, less than one person out of ten, which is seven percent, will start a business. It's a contradiction. What is the problem? The problem is that an innovation in the U.S. Take Google, for instance. I wish you know how many jobs it has created. Millions of jobs around the world. One simple innovation, a search engine. You know. Now. Recently, Uganda innovated a Rolex, <laughs> which a minister, the late Mutagamba, went out to show. Good innovation. What is the problem? Low value. Our innovations are very, very low value. Border, border. Boy, these people are innovating. They have money. It's good for them, but not good for the economy because they are low level low quality, low impact innovations, you know? So, yes, we are very innovative, but in the wrong things. And, by the way, there is this myth of business failure. It's a myth. Entrepreneurs don't fail. Once you are an entrepreneur, you don't fail. They move on. 
the business may fail, but not the entrepreneur. And doesn't fail because he didn't know what to do. He, f he closes because he can no longer make a profit in it. But you know, everybody's talking about, you know, business who don't make it the third year, one year. One year. It's, it's, it's all, is it, the Americans call it bullshit. <laughs> You know, in our language here, we don't use those words. Yeah. You know? yeah. If you were brought up well like me, <laughs> so what did they say? You know. So, uh, yes, the challenge with our businesses is they are low quality. Go to slums. There are so many businesses in there. You know, but people are in slums and they can't get out because they cannot make. Uh, never make enough money mm -hmm. to get out of those slums. They are selling chapati, they are riding border border. You know what do you do with the border border? Maybe you can grow them to ten. Genuinely, eh? you are making profit, and if you may grow them to ten, you have now ten border borders. Uh, so that that is uh, Uganda is very entrepreneurial, but that enterprise is in low quality business. That's why I'm putting emphasis on high impact, high value. That's where we need to go. But there's a problem. When you see all these things that we do here, yeah. there are some people out there in the developed countries who are preventing us from succeeding. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. I use this example very often. I think even I think yesterday I must have written it on my Facebook about um, we produce coffee here, but we, we don't get the value out of it. We produce coffee, we earn about five hundred million dollars from it, and Germany re processes it, exports it, and earns eight billion dollars out of our coffee. Why? Value addition. Value addition is missing. And they have caught us in laws, trade laws, and we've agreed, we've signed them. They've allowed us to export only vehicles and aircrafts and things like that, tax-free. You can't produce it in the airplane here. Now, those are policy issues which you need to be, as an entrepreneur, you need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. You know, you may, work, you may go into coffee, but you will never make the money that German companies make, you know. So, yes, the, the, the we are very entrepreneurial as a country. People want to start up businesses, but the business is low quality, low impact, you know. If you had buses, by the way, you, you know, but the is very expensive, are you aware? Yeah. It's very expensive. If you had buses, I mean, you don't pay that much money. Buses carry people in the bulk, but border borders are expensive, they are accident prone, but the people who are running them make money, you know, so you can't say they should stop. Um, then the other question, the second question is on uh, uh, the, the social enterprise. Uh, where has social enterprise come from? Social enterprise originates from what you call philanthropy. Philanthropy is the rich people getting the feeling that they need to give back to society, you know? Now, it evolved from there to what we call corporate social responsibility. Now, corporate social responsibility has two aspects to it. One, businesses should not knowingly harm society. For instance, Coca-Cola, I, I, um, I'm one of the people who did the Coca-Cola project, brought it here, and at some stage, we were disposing our effluent. You know, that, that, that process has got some chemicals. We're putting it into a river, into a stream. I didn't know, I had no idea, but these were doing it deliberately because they didn't want to go into expenses of, of, uh, uh, of first of all, you know, uh, getting the, F, the, the, what do you call it? 
uh, processing that that effluence. Yeah. Now, so Coca Cola should not knowingly harm the public. That's part of corporate responsibility. But it's also true that organizations should be able to attend to society's problems. There's a time when you had so much HIV AIDS talk in the country. Organizations were supposed to look at this as a problem and address it, make a contribution to it. You know? Now, that is a, some kind of uh, organized philanthropy from the corporate perspective. Now, the individuals today who have made so much money, I mean, if you go to Europe and then the, the States, somebody has so much money and leaves it to his cut. I've left my $10 million to a cut. What does a cut understand? But that's the company he had over the years. You know? Um, so what is happening is that these people possibly feel guilty how come I made so much money? You, you should actually listen to Steve Jobs' last speech. It will tell you about making money. Because Steve Jobs, the man who made so much money in this world, died of cancer at the age of 56, 57. And on his deathbed, he said money is not everything. I'm sure he would have said he wished to have, to have helped the different communities to improve. Correct. Bill Gates has picked from there. He's now giving away the money. What will, what will the money do when he's dead? Nothing. You know? So, uh, possibly they get the guilt and um, they start giving back to society. Maybe. I, I can't say. Maybe. But this has been quite an, uh, an engaging discussion with Professor Waswa Balunyo. Uh, I wish we wouldn't stop the discussion and go all day because when you see more hands going up, that means it's, it's fruitful. Uh, but uh, just in the conclusion, you know, to bring this discussion to an end, we would love to say or just ask you that if you had one piece of advice to someone, uh, someone just starting out, what would it be? I would say that uh, do not be comfortable with what you have. Well said by Professor Waso Balinua, and that brings our show to an end. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being part of this show, and that is at kafero.tv, uh, kafero that is Unpack Show, that we bring every single time to make sure that you are able to interact and uh, learn from insightful persons such as Professor Waswa. And for everyone that has been here, we say that keep commenting and sharing the information on different social media platforms. Like I said, on Facebook, that is at Cafero Foundation. On Twitter, you can follow us, that is at Cafero Foundation. And be able to make sure that someone out there does not miss out on what has just been shared. Thank you so much for listening. As your host, my name is Newton Bayo, and I say thank you so much for listening once again. <laughs>